So I'm very, very happy, very pleased to welcome John, John Venari, to, um, to the retreat house for this conference. Uh, I've known John for, I don't know how many years. Quite a few years. Quite a few years. Decades. Uh, he, used to be, he used to be a parishioner of ours in St. Catharines in Canada. And um, I always appreciate John's, John's talk. So without any further ado, Mr. Venari. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, the retreat house here. Uh, thanks to Father Violette, and thank you all for coming out on this icy day. And um, I have a lot of material to cover today, so I'm going to get right to it. So please get comfortable, because what we're going to do is I'm going to start with a present drama. We're going to go back and look at where it came from, and I'm going to give you a highway drive of about 300 years of intellectual history. And then once we know where we are, once we know where we came from, then we're gonna look where we're going. And that's probably the most frightening part of the talk because everything I'm saying is based on the research of what I found, of what this man, Pope <laughs> Francis, plans to do and the direction he wants to take the church. So the present drama. Some of you probably know this, that a few weeks ago, Cardinal Raymond Burke, who had been head of the Vatican Roman Rota and is relieved of these duties, he said publicly in an interview in, in TV France, he says, I will resist any effort of Pope Francis to allow divorced and remarried Catholics to receive communion, because that's the present drama right now, especially with the synods. So Cardinal Burke, yes, <clears throat> he has a corrupt program to resist, as we all, as do we all because it appears everything shows that Pope Francis has, all, despite all this synod, despite all this input from around the world, Pope Francis has already made up his mind that he is determined to allow communion to divorced and remarried Catholics. So anyway, um, I'm gonna give you the evidence for that, but first I wanna talk about what Cardinal Burke says. Now, Cardinal Burke says, February 8 interview in France 2 television, spotlighting the ongoing drama with the synods, Burke says, I cannot accept that communion be given to persons living in an irregular union because it is adultery. That's the word our Lord used. So the interviewer says, how do you intend to place Pope Francis on a good path? Cardinal says, on this, one must be very attentive regarding the power of the Pope. The classic formulation is that the Pope has the plentitude of power, the fullness of power, this is true, but it is not absolute power. His power is to be at the service of the faith, and thus the Pope does not have the power to change teaching or to change doctrine, okay? Happy Cardinal Burke is saying this. We've been saying this for 45 years, all right? We all know that. So anyway, interviewer says, in a somewhat provocative way, can we say that you are the true guardian of doctrine and not Pope Francis? So Burke smiles and he says, let's leave, leave aside the matter of the Pope it is true doctrine that guides us. What if Pope Francis insists on this path? What will you do? And here Burke delivers the payload. I will resist. I cannot do anything else. There is no doubt that this is a difficult time. This is clear. Is it painful? Burke says yes. Is it worrisome? Burke says yes. Well then, is Pope Francis your friend? <laughs> And Burke says, well, I wouldn't want to make an enemy of the Pope. He didn't quite answer that. So, uh, but it's obvious that any prelate or any Catholic who insists that the Eucharist cannot be given to divorce or remarried, they are going to find themselves at odds with Pope Francis because Francis, and we're going to talk about this more towards the end of the talk, Francis is primarily a people over doctrine talk, Pope, okay? People over doctrine. I have the doctrine, I have the discipline, but what do I have in front of me? I have a person. I have a person who has a problem, a person on the periphery that I need to bring in and reinstate, and despite the fact that he might be living a life that's incompatible with Catholicism. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but as far as Francis, I'm gonna give you a quick checklist to demonstrate that he is determined to do this. The late Cardinal Martini of Milan, probably the most progressivist cardinal, Martini consider, considers John Paul II a raving conservative, okay? Yeah. 
Um, he was one of the most modernist prelates of our time, and here's what he said in his final interview. He said that the Catholic Church is 200 years behind the times. He says that our rights, our R-I-T-E-S, our rights and our dress are pompous. And he encouraged opening up reception of the Eucharist to married and divorced, uh, divorced and remarried Catholics. He counseled against, in this regard, what he calls discrimination. What did Francis do on the first anniversary of Martini's death? Francis unleashed unqualified praise on Martini. He called Martini a father of the whole ch for, for the whole church and he went on to celebrate Martini as a prophetic figure and a man of discernment of, and peace. Okay, I could give a whole, I did in fact, I, hold a wrote, I wrote a whole article about it, how much Francis resembles Martini. Fra for example, Martini was the one years, a couple years back who said regarding homosexuals, who am I to judge? Martini is the one who said, I don't believe in a Catholic God. Bergoglio has said the exact same thing since he's become Pope, okay. So, that's Martini. Then we move into our dear friend, Walter Cardinal Casper. Uh, I like Cardinal Casper. I like Cardinal Casper because he says openly what the, what the agenda is. He doesn't hide it. Um, but, last year's consistory, February 2014, Cardinal Casper delivered his speech in front of all the cardinals, shocking many of them, saying that we should, be, we should institute a pastoral, a new pastoral approach that would allow divorced and remarried Catholics to receive the Eucharist. And the next day, in front of all the world's cardinals of that consistory, now I was in Rome at that point, but I wasn't part of this because no outsiders are in, but it was in the news afterwards, Pope Francis publicly praised Walter Casper. He singled out Walter Casper for praise for Casper's proposal of divorce and remarried for uh, to be given communion. And here's what he said. We have the quote. Yesterday before going to sleep in front of all the cardinals, including the new ones, but yesterday before going to sleep, I read or rather reread the work of Cardinal Casper. And I would like to thank him because I found profound theology and even serene thinking in theology. Excuse me, eminence, if I embarrass you, but the idea is that this so-called, that, this, that, that uh, the idea is that this is called doing theology on one's knees. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if that's not a ringing endorsement, I, ringing endorsements just don't exist. Moving on to the 2013 book biography about Pope Francis, it's called Untying the Knot by an author named Paul Vallelay. It's good books, not, not the best. The best is by Austin Ivory, but we'll get to that later. But Valle is an admirer of Francis, and he explains that in Argentina, and especially amongst these, um, you know, what you call the slum apostolates, the, the priests going out to the slums and dealing with poor people, nothing wrong with that, but they bend doctrine in the process. He, Valle points out that giving communion to divorced and remarried Catholics down there in Buenos Aires and South America, it's no big deal. It's done all the time. What's the problem? Here's what he says. In Buenos Aires, Bergoglio came across more concrete problems. This is Father Zampani, a diocesan priest, says this from Buenos Aires. When you're working in a shanty town, 90% of your congregation are single or divorced. You have to learn that communion for the divorced and remarried is not an issue here. Everyone takes communion. And Valle goes on to comment. He says, Bergoglio never his never altered his doctrinal orthodoxy on such matters, but he did not allow dogmas to overrule the priority of pastoral concern. We're going to talk a lot about that, pastoral over doctrine. And then he quotes uh, another slum priest, who, uh, Father uh, Essamundi, who says Bergoglio was never rigid about the small and stupid stuff because he was interested in something deeper, close quote. So this means that Bergoglio comes from a background where communion for remarried and divorced Catholics is considered a small non-issue. It's called the small and stupid stuff, as compared to the larger issue, say, of preferential option for the poor. OK, April 2014, Pope Francis personally telephones an Argentine woman who is married to a previously divorced man to tell her 
that she is free to receive communion no matter what her parish priest says. He says, just go find someone else. Now, Vatican spokesman Father Lombardi confirmed that the phone call took place, but he would not or could not comment on the details. And despite the colossal scandal that this has caused over the past eight months or more, maybe even more, he has yet to publicly deny that he gave the green light to this woman living in adultery, as our Lord would say, the okay to receive communion. Then we move into the synod, that root and toot and rock and roll and synod of 2014, the extraordinary synod. The final synod's relatio contained three paragraphs that failed to obtain the two-third majority vote. The bishops talk about these things, and then they put the paragraphs to the vote, and if it doesn't receive two-thirds majority, it's not supposed to be in the final document. Okay. Now, the, docu- the, the three paragraphs I'm talking about was the, the, the possibility, discussing the possibility of communion for divorced and remarried, the, the section on cohabitation, which was rather awful, and also homosexuality. Okay, now, this first paragraph is what we're talking about, though, the, the business of, of divorced and remarried Catholics, Pope Francis insisted that that paragraph still be included in the final document, even though it failed to receive the two-third majority vote. And this is contrary to the rules of the Senate itself. The rejected paragraph is now in the new working document for next year's Synod. And there's no mention that this, not even a footnote saying that this paragraph failed to achieve the two-thirds majority. Now, Life cites Hillary White, very good reporter. Here's what she says about this, because she's in Rome is her beat, and she talks to these, to these bishops who were there. <laughs> Hillary White says, one of the Synod fathers who had attended many such meetings of the past said that retaining sections in a Synod's final relatio that has been rejected by the bishop's vote was unprecedented. Such paragraphs in former Synod's would simply be dropped and never seen again in any subsequent document. So what we see here, close quote, is this heavy-handed abuse of authority to force the issue. Basically, Francis is acting like Barack Obama. Okay, he just forces it through. Executive action, we could call it. So anyway, he's giving executive amnesty to divorced and remarried Catholics. So um, now... This is actually, too, what he's doing is what you could call the worst form of heavy-handed clericalism, which is something he constantly decries. But even more troubling, I'd mentioned the new working document called the Lineamenta, the Vatican's guiding document for the upcoming Synod on the Family in 2014. (laughs) It's part of the questionnaire that comes to the doctors. The document tells leaders, now I'm, I'm quoting now, to avoid in their responses a formulation of pastoral care that is, basically sim- uh, that is based simply on an application of doctrine. All right, did you hear that? Avoid in your responses a formulation of pastoral cares that are based simply on doctrine. For such an approach, it says, would not respect the conclusion of the extraordinary synod assembly and would lead their reflections far from the path already indicated. Okay, so first of all, this is textbook modernism. We're going to be talking about this to exalt the pastoral over the doctrinal. And when you do that, it's not pastoral, it's unpastoral. And secondly, um, it, uh, it, it, it is an open admission that the October's extraordinary synod departed from doctrine. Because if you're faithful to doctrine, you're not faithful to the 2014 synod. The Lineamenta goes on to say the bishops are to be guided, this is a quote, are to be guided by the pastoral approach which is grounded in Vatican II and the magisterium of Pope Francis. Not the magisterium of the church of all time, but if you remember Flip Wilson, the magisterium of the church of what's happening now. This is what we got. So, the extraordinary synod of 2014 is to be the point of departure, the guiding light for the future, and there should be no attempt to begin anew. So we forget the necessary cohesion between doctrine and practice. Our new starting point is the extraordinary synod and the alleged needs of the the present moment. You might know this too, Cardinal Baldessari, who is hand-picked by uh, Pope Francis to be the chair of this synod, um, 
He said in a recent conference in, in January, he told the crowd during the question and answer section that yes, doctrine can change. He just says it flat out. That's the one good thing about this pontificate. They're saying openly what the previous pontificates did anyway, but would cover it up. This pontificate says it openly. But this is a blueprint for revolution. So, Cardinal Burke, the conflict is not only coming, the conflict is here, because Francis appears to be hell-bent on imposing this top-down abuse on the entire church. Now, I told you I want to step back to see where some of this came from. We're going to go into a fairly recent history, and then we're going to go further back in history. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is I want to impress upon everyone here that this is not just some light thing, so this light quirk that's going on now. This has a deep history, and because of, the, of its deep roots, it's going to take a while or a miracle to, to straighten it out because the thinking is so perverse. So... Basically, all of this Vatican II approach came from what is called the new theology, the modernist new theology. It is the scrapping of Thomism, scholasticism, the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, the adoption of new philosophies, and also, which ends up, is the scrapping of doctrine. But I want to concentrate on a major error that was dealt with by three popes, and you would think that this would not be a problem for churchmen. It is a huge problem. It is the belief that doctrine can change over time. It is the belief that truth changes over time. We start with 1907, Pius X having to go after the heresy of modernism. It was the notion that truth changes over time. The truth is in a state of flux. The truth can change from age to age. Now, I'm going to 1910, but it seems to be kind of a perennial error. You go back 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, uh, the philosopher, very bright man, uh, Heraclitus, Heraclitus rather, uh, he basically taught that everything is in a state of flux and you never put your foot in the same river at this, uh, because it's always moving and life is always moving. It took Aristotle to straighten that out. We won't go into that. But anyway, everything is changing. Nothing is permanent. We see it going through Hegel into Marx, antithesis, uh, thesis, antithesis, this, new synthesis. But now we have it entering the church through modernism. And Pius X gets to the root problem of modernism. Quote, in Pescendi, the modernists pervert the eternal concept of truth. Truth can change over time. He condemned modernism, you all know this, in Pescendi and in the Syllabus of Errors, and condemned error number 58. This is a condemned error, quote, truth is no more immutable, unchangeable, truth is no more immutable than man himself since it evolved with him, in him, and through him. This is the root error, this belief that truth can change over time. Okay, 1907. Then Pius X promulgates 1910, the oath against modernism, because he knows he has not killed modernism, he's just driven it underground, and he instates the oath that every priest has to take before being ordained, also any, I, I'm sure any, every seminary professor, and I think anyone who's teaching at a university. Here it is, after Pius X does all this, and he sets up this committee of vigilance to watchdog over all of this, the problem still does not go away. Pius XI has to deal with the exact same problem in 1924. This is a condemned proposition that was issued by the Holy Office. In other words, the Holy Office is saying this idea is condemned, and he has to do it from the Holy Office because it's something that is called on amongst modern philosophers and theologians. Now, it's kind of technical, so listen up. It says, this is the error. Truth is not found in any particular act of the intellect were in conformity with the object would be had, as the scholastics say. Rather, truth is always in a state of becoming and consists of a progressive alignment that is the adequation of the understanding with life, not with the external object, with life, which is always moving, namely a certain perpetual process by which the intellect strives to develop and explain that which experience presents as or action requires, by which principle, moreover, all is in progression, nothing is ever determined or fixed. 
condemned Proposition 1924, a good 14 years after Pius X had already condemned the proposition that truth can change over time. We move into the 1940s, same problem, same error, now issued under a new cloak called the New Theology. And here's what Pius XII says. Providentially, he was giving this warning to Jesuits. Here's what he said. There is a good deal of talk but without the necessary clarity of concept about a new theology, what, which must be in constant transformation, following the examples of all other things in the world, which are in a constant state of flux and movement without ever reaching their term. If we were to accept such an opinion, he says, what would become of the unchangeable dogmas of the Catholic faith, and what would become of the unity and stability of that faith, okay? Now, of course, this is a rhetorical question. He's not saying, gosh, what's going to happen? No, he knows it's the end of the unity and stability of the faith if you follow this, this warped process. It's like when our Lord said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He's telling us he won't find faith on earth. Same thing here. Now, what was Pius XII reacting against? Well, now we're coming into some names that we know. Pius XII was reacting against the partisans of the modernist new theology, names and stars like Father Henri de Lubac, Father Dominic Chenu, Father Hans Urs von Balthasar, Father Yves Congar, Father Henri Bouillard, Father Karl Rahner, and yes, Father Joseph Ratzinger and Archbishop Karl Wojtyla. Now, Ratzinger and Wojtyla were not movers and shakers in the 40s, but they were disciples that disseminated this new theology throughout the entire church through Vatican II and through their high office. Okay, so new theology is actually very simple. You can boil it down to three basic components. First, in philosophy, it is a new synthesis between the Greek fathers and modern philosophies, okay? What do they do in this process? The Greek fathers are back in the, you know, the third to fifth centuries, whatever. Modern philosophies, who have they jumped over and, 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 and avoided? St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? And the real emphasis, too, they talk about the Greek fathers. The real emphasis, we're going to see, is an adaptation to modern philosophy, which we're going to talk about. Second, which we're not going to talk about this this point, the breaking down of distinction between the natural and supernatural orders, paramount, colossal problem. We don't have time to deal with that today. And the third, the belief that then there can be some transformation of the dogmatic message of the church over the course of the centuries. The belief that theology must keep changing and adapting itself to the needs from age to age. The Jesuit father and proponent of the new theology, Father Henri Bouillard, direct quote, he says, a theology that is not current, that is, in other words, that does not change with the times, will be a false theology. Okay, this is in the 40s, 1940s. So we move onward to Vatican II. Theologians of the new theology were the central theologians of Vatican II. John XXIII insisted that the trouble, these troublemakers be there. De Lubac, Congar, Rahner, Ratzinger, Wojtyla. And Father Enrici, a Jesuit who was an advocate of the new theology, he says that the new theology, De Lubac's theology, which insists on, the, I'm quoting now, which insists on the non-opposition between, opposition between nature and supernature, became the official theology of Vatican II. And Father Henri Bouillard, another disciple of the New Theology, he actually wrote in triumph. He was so happy that the word supernatural does not appear in the document. I know it doesn't appear in Dei Verbum, perhaps the entire of Vatican II. So Vatican II, what was it? It was a council of change, exactly what Pius XII talked about. Constant change, change, change. New approach. We no longer try to convert non-Catholics, but we have convergence with non-Catholics through an ecumenical rapprochement. Okay? We dialogue with the world rather than stand up to it the way the crusty old Pius IX and that nasty old syllabus of errors did. Okay? High churchmen, as I said, they praise Vatican II as a counter-syllabus. 
Cardinal Ratzinger praised it as a cardinal uh, as a counter syllabus. Father Eve Kungar praised it as a counter syllabus, and and um, the New Ecumenical approach. Now I want to show here that the New Ecumenical Church approach is right in the documents of Vatican II. It's not just a misinterpretation, because I have a book, Theological Highlights of Vatican II, where Father Ratzinger explains that the that the decree on ecumenism of Vatican II was squarely based on Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium, it's the dogmatic constitution of the church, and there's nothing dogmatic about it. It just means this is a teaching document. It's not a dogma that we have to you know, abide by. But the dogmatic constitution of the Lumen Gentium was structured in such a way in what it said and also, most importantly, what it refused to affirm it was written pastorally and ecumenically so that the decree on ecumenism could be built on top of it. I have a whole talk about that. I'm not going to deal with it now. But in the end, what this he said is the, is the message of Lumen Gentium regarding non-Catholics. He says, a basic unity of churches, quoting Father Ratzinger, 1966, a basic unity of churches that remain churches yet become one church must replace the idea of conversion, even though conversion retains its meaningfulness for those unconscious motivated to seek it. Okay, now, of course, Ratzinger was a co-worker with Karl Rahner. He's in a position to know exactly what was in the mind of the men who drafted these documents, and he's telling us that buried in the, or, or part of the fabric of Vatican II is that conversion is now an option, not a necessity. Cardinal Walter Casper, again, my good friend, he's very helpful to us. He says flat out in 2001, today we no longer understand ecumenism in the sense of a return by which others would be converted and return to being Catholics. This was expressly abandoned in Vatican II. Casper understands the documents. He understands them. And uh, so I want to deal with this idea, the belief that there can be some transformation of the church over the course of the centuries. Again, change, the idea that truth changes, is the primary error of our age. But what's very important is this is not necessarily a theological error. It is primarily a philosophical level error. Monsignor William Smith, who was a very good moral theologian who taught at Dunwoody Seminary, he said that many of today's theological errors are basic errors in philosophy twisted ways of thinking. And of course, the great Dominican Thomas Father Garrigou Lagrange, he said in 1945, regarding the new theology, he said that the current state in the church, quote, current crisis in the church has been not a crisis of faith, but of a very grave malady of intellect. Okay, you have to keep that in mind. Not so much a crisis of faith, but of a grave malady of intellect. Twisted, perverse, thinking. And, true, and the, the, the idea that truth can change is at the very heart of the present crisis of faith. Now, so that I don't just stand here and spout off about all these things that are so bad and awful, uh, I'm going to give you a quick response to this idea that truth can change. Anybody who has, any, uh, who has studied the, uh, the good manuals, such as Adolf Tanqueray, uh, the great Catholic writers, the great Catholic theology manuals, know that we support, the, uh, we support a truth of the faith by three means. We show proof from scripture, we show proof from tradition, and we show proof from reason. So I put together this little three-part uh, demonstration of the fact that truth can change. It's amazing we have to even try to prove this, but today we do. So, scripture, Hebrews 13, 8, our Lord said, I mean, we read St. Paul who says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our Lord called himself a rock. He didn't call himself shifting st stands or, or, or a snowbank in the wind. Okay? And then Galatians. But though we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Okay? The truth does not change. In fact, Archbishop Lefebvre invoked that um, passage from Galatians, I think, in the 1974 statement, didn't he? Anyway, so, Scripture. Tradition, the teaching of Pope St. Agatho, died in 681, quote, nothing of the things appointed ought to be diminished, nothing changed, nothing added, but they must be preserved both as regards expression 
and meaning. We move into Vatican I, we actually get a dogmatic explanation in, through this infallible council of what retaining tradition means. Let therefore the understanding and knowledge and the wisdom of individual, of individual men, I'm quoting the council now, Vatican I, and all men and one man and of the entire church grow and advance greatly and powerfully over the course of the years and ages, but only in its own class, in the same doctrine, with the same meaning, and in the same explanation. Okay? No change. This very terminology is picked up and used again in the 1910 Oath Against Modernism. The man who takes the oath makes the following promise. I sincerely receive the doctrine of the faith handed down to us from the apostles through the Orthodox Fathers with the same meaning and the same explanation. And consequently, I completely reject the heretical fiction of an evolution of dogma changing from one meaning to another, different from that which the church first held. Okay, a lot more we could do, but this is what we're going to, this is the quote from the magisterium we'll use. And finally, the quote, the, the, the proof from reason, and there's no better way to show a proof from reason is to quote the crown prince of reason, who is G.K. Chesterton. In his book, Orthodoxy, he describes this idea of the notion of changeability of doctrine. Here's what he says. He says, an imbecile habit has arisen in the modern controversy of saying that such and such a creed can be held in one age, but cannot be held in another. Some dogma, we are told, was credible in the 12th century, but not credible in the 20th. You might as well say that a certain philosophy can be believed on Mondays, but it cannot be believed on Tuesdays. Okay, that's just it, just, this, just boiling it down to the simple and the matter of fact. But where did this new theology come from? The new theology and modernism is actually the product of 300 years of bad thinking. Bad thinking is the layman's definition of false philosophy. Because I want to, and I want to cover this quickly. We're going to get a highway drive through this, but I'm going to, well, you'll see why I'm doing it. So anyway, what we have, the more I study, the more I see, the more I read, especially the more I read these great handful of Thomists prior to the council who were warning against all of this. It's amazing. They knew what was coming. They didn't, I think they believe, I think they never thought the council would go this far. But they point out that the main error of the time that the church is asked to compromise with is the error of existentialism. Um, this is the product, again, of two to three hundred years of bad philosophy. And I'm going to, as I said, for our purpose, I'm going to cover this quickly. I want to start with the German philosophy for an intellectual troublemaker, Immanuel Kant. Now, he lived from 1724 to 1804. Again, I am going to do this quickly. I could go back to Descartes, but I want to start with Kant. And just so you know, this is just not my own observations. Pope St. Pius X, dealing with modernism, he said Kant is the modern heresy, K-A-N-T. And Abbe, uh, Abbot Marmion, the great spiritual writer, who was also a crackerjack Thomist and received his Thomistic training from the priest who was commissioned by Leo XIII to restore Thomistic philosophy. He was trained in Rome by this man. Abbot Marmion said in a letter he wrote in, 19, in 1907, about that time about modernism, he says, we are asked to baptize the philosophy of Kant, and you can no more baptize Kant than you can baptize an ape. Okay, these people are trying to baptize the ape. Now, what we have is the rise of something called idealism. Now, idealism can be misleading because it sounds like we're talking about the ideal. Okay, it would be ideal if I could get a flight to Venice for $300. Okay, we're not talking about idea. We're talking about the primacy of idea. The idea. You'll, you'll understand in a minute why I'm saying this. Okay, ideaism is what it is. It means that we can only, that we only know the idea of something, but we don't know the thing itself. So, what's the correct way of thinking? Of course, this is what Gary Gulagrange, St. Thomas, they would all tell you. It is the correspondence, Pius XI touched on this in his, uh, in his 1924 statement, it is the adequation of the intellect to the extra-mental reality. 
extra mental being outside the mental. This microphone is a microphone. It impresses itself on my intellect through my senses. And I can affirm, yes, that is, and I come to the judgment, yes, that is a microphone because it does what a microphone does, okay? I can know it from the outside. So truth is the adequation of the intellect with the extra mental reality. Now, that's common sense. That's how I know I'm in possession of the truth. This is the primacy of the objective. That's what I'm getting to with this. The primacy of the objective. But Kant is going to turn all that on his head. Kant says, no. We don't know. We don't know the thing in itself. What do I know? Well, when I really think about it scientifically, what I do know is, is that I only know the images that are in my head. Because all this information is coming in, but and the eyes, I guess, are delivering it to me, but... I'm still relying on the internal process of my intellect to work out what is going on out there. So I don't know how much is coming from the outside and how much I am mixing it up. My intellect is mixing it up as it's delivering it to me. So he makes this false distinction between the phenomena and the noumena. It's very interesting. I study this with Dr. Burnett. He makes a terrific point about Kant. Kant comes up with all these German, I, th I think this is how German words work, these big German words that they kind of they click together like freight trains, and you have know, these huge German words. He has a lot of that in his, in his uh, philosophy books. But he'll, he'll never mention something like a tree or a dog or anything that's really real. It's all this wild theory. So anyway, he makes this distinction between the phenomena and the noumena. The noumena is what, the phenomena is what I know coming from the outside. It's the idea I have for what I have on the outside, but I don't really know if it corresponds to what's out there. The noumena is what's really out there, but I can't know it. Okay, what does he do with us then? He traps me in my own head. I am trapped. I can't get out. Because I don't know how, you know, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, this is what it's really about. He is critiquing the modern, crazy philosophies of the 19th century. That's why nothing makes sense, but that's, that's another talk. But anyway, so, of course, Immanuel Kant knew, coming from living in Protestant Lutheran Germany, he knew nothing about St. Thomas Aquinas. In fact, it's been said that Kant knew as much about Aquinas as Aquinas knew about Kant. Um, with Kant, the objective reality can't be known. I can only know what's in there. So what does it do in my head? It destroys to Aristotelian to mystic metaphysics. What is philosophy except, this is from Dr. Waters, certain knowledge of all things through their ultimate causes in the light of the principles of reason. Okay, this is what philosophy is, knowing the external word and knowing the cause of things, knowing what things are. Kant destroys that. He destroys any idea of a speculative proof for God's existence, because we can't know outside reality anyway. So you throw out St. Thomas Aquinas' five ways to prove the existence of God. With Kant, then, everything has to be subjective. What I understand, what I think it is, what it seems to be to me. Nothing is objective, okay? Now, this triumph in, of subjectivity, believe it or not, and we have the history to prove it, it catches on. And it catches on big time. And even amongst those good, well-meaning men who tried to provide an answer, we're going to see they themselves don't know how to get out of it. One such man is Søren Kierkegaard. He was some sort of Christian. Uh, he didn't really believe in organized religion. A Danish Protestant theologian, lived from 1813 to 1855, relatively short life. Now, he's a well-meaning Protestant, and he just, he just knows God exists. I know God exists, and I know that I'm supposed to have some sort of meaningful relationship with him. And I know that there's a real world out there, and I need to know what it is. But the problem with Kierkegaard is he still remains locked in subjectivism in his solution. Here's Kierkegaard's solution. Now listen to this. And this man's well-meaning. He's, he's, he's not a scoundrel. He's well-meaning. He's just confused. What I really need is to get clear about what I must do, not what I must know, except insofar as knowledge, as knowledge, oh, I have a misspelling here. That's why I'm confused. 
insofar as knowledge must precede every act, what matters is to find a purpose, to see what it is that God wills that I should do. The crucial, thi the crucial thing is to find truth, which is truth for me, to find the idea for which I am willing to die for. Okay, he's trying to break out of the subjectivism. He can't do it. He's looking for truth, but he still ends up with a system that subjectivity measures value, what it means to me. So, of course, he's going to stress the importance of personal response. He's going to stress the importance of individual conscience. And because we're still trapped in idealism, he is trying to break out of, he says that we basically have to go to God by a leap of faith. There is really no external apologetical argument that can prove God to us. It just has to be a leap of faith. Again, out goes the five ways of St. Thomas. So he emphasizes the self, the self's relation to the world, self-reflection, and introspection. This is in the early 1830s. It sounds familiar. It sounds quite modern. It sounds like last Friday's Oprah Winfrey show. Okay, that's how they talk, what it means to me, self-reflection. Now, what means is, is that what comes into play primarily is emotions and feelings in regard to religion. Kierkegaard would emphasize the supposed living of doctrine over knowledge of doctrine. You see where we're headed. Activity over doctrine. Pastoral over doctrine. We're seeing the roots of it in the early 18th century. This is why I say this is a long-standing problem. So this subjectivism, and this is kind of interesting too, this subjectivism, this existentialism, this because it's what it is, it's existentialism, the person is just affirming his own existence and what it means to them, so it's existism or existentialism, okay? This carries on through the 20th century and into the 21st, very big in the early 20th century. Um, and because existentialism is so subjective, then it's going to vary greatly depending upon the person who adopts it. So then you have, what you end up with is you have, uh, you see it in the early 20th century, a, a, a Catholic existentialist philosopher, Gabriel Marcel. How would he acknowledge that you exist? Well, Marcel would say he's a Christian man wanting to do the right things, and he would say that I can know and acknowledge of your, your I can know and acknowledge your existence because I know I can enter into this beautiful I thou human relationship, this human communion with you. Okay, very nice. Then there is the nasty atheistic philosopher Jean Paul Sartre existentialist philosopher, and he would say, I know and acknowledge you exist because you're in my way. Okay, same, same structure, same subjectivism, two very different ways of believing and acting it out. Now, this slides right into the new approach of the Second Vatican Council, because the modernist new theology and I am going to get to Pope Francis a little later, so don't despair. Well, you will despair when you, anyway. But the, uh, <laughs> the modernist new theology, which triumphed at Vatican II, was based on an attempt to baptize this existentialism. This is what these great Thomas of the 40s and the 50s and early 60s were screaming against. Nobody was listening. Okay, fight like Anthony Lee, Father Anthony Lee, and Father David Greenstock, and Monsignor Joseph Clifford Fenton, and Gary Lagrange. They're all screaming against this adaptation of existentialism, nobody's listening, or not enough people are listening. But here we go again. I'm going to give you the three basic points of the new theology. First, a new synthesis between the Greek fathers and modern philosophies, such as agnosticism and skepticism, and of course, existentialism, playing down St. Thomas in the process. Second, breaking down the distinction between nature and supernature, and third, the belief that there can be some transformation of the dogmatic message of the church over the course of the centuries. Now, I want to concentrate on this first point when we come to the philosopher Maurice Blondel. Maurice Blondel provided the philosophy, the subjectivist philosophy, on which Henri de Lubac based his new theology. Now, we're, we're going to repeat a little bit what you, what you heard already. 
Because Blondel's basic argument is that modern man is completely awash in subjectivism. It, it, this is the world in which he lives. Uh, there is no object, they don't, he doesn't really understand modern man objective truth. There's only subjective truth, what is, again, what's meaningful to me, what, give, what I find valuable, valuable or of value. I define external reality, I define external morality, okay? Now, again, Blondel is dead on target in his observation, but where he goes awry is in his proposed solution. Since modern man is awash in subjectivism, Blondel says, then it is through subjectivism by which we must contact and, 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 and evangelize modern man. So you don't give him proofs of the existence of God. You don't give him the, 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 the arguments of the motives of credibility the Vatican I talked about. You just give him a powerful and positive religious experience. Now, I'll make a distinction here. We all know there are some people, that's where you do have to start. You have to bring them into a rosary or bring them into a Tridentine Mass, and they experience Catholicism. Okay, it's not a bad place to start, but it's a bad place to stay because we have to learn the faith and the truths of the faith. And also, he's proposing this as the new system for the universal church. Do away with objective teaching. Do away with Aquinas. So, as I said, since modern man is awash in subjectivism, we have to go to him through this sub subjectivism. And um, the problem, of course, is, is that rather than pull modern man out of the sickbed of subjectivism, Blondell wants the church to jump into the sickbed, imbibe the disease, and then use that as some sort of <laughs> rapprochement, some time of, of way of getting through to the sick man. So as I said, great Thomas prior to the council, nobody knows their names, like Father David Greenstock. He's writing against the new theology in 1950 in the Thomist. He's, he, and he is acknowledging the fact that the new theology is operating on this agenda, uh, this, this, this principle, that the man on the street is basically brought up on rationalism and sentiment. Sentiment is driving him. And he's sealed his mind against any approach on the old traditional lines. We don't give him logical terms from Thomism. He's not going to accept them. So the new theology argues, as I said, and this is Greenstock now, we have to get rid of Thomistic philosophy and theology and replace it with modern philosophical systems. And what is the modern philosophical system of the time? Existentialism and subjectivism. Okay, but here's what Greenstock says. 1950, we are asked to accept in exchange for the solid foundation of objective Thomism the fluid concepts of a new philosophy designed to change with the times, we are told, like everything else in this fluid world. This, to our way of thinking, is merely, not merely unreasonable, but also very dangerous. Okay, He's talking in elevated terminology. It's clear what he's saying. So, Father Anthony Lee. Oh, one thing I wanted to point out, too. Father Anthony Lee, Father Gary Goulagrange, Father Greenstock, they all point out the partisans of the new theology. What do they all have in common? This visceral hatred of Aquinas. This visceral hatred. Joseph Ratzinger himself, maybe, I wasn't there in the 1950s when he was at the seminary, maybe he received his Thomistic philosophy in a very dry or boring manner. I don't know what. He rejected Thomistic philosophy well on. He said it's too static, too ready-made, doesn't really deal with the problems of, of, that modern man faces. Okay. Um, they all have that in common. Even though de Lubac and Congar will give this lip service to St. Thomas, but as Greenstock says, what's significant in the writings of de Lubac and Congar when they talk about Aquinas is the crucial passage that they do not repeat. So anyway, Father Anthony Lee, another great Thomist, 1963, he's writing about this, warning against this. We're, right, we're, at, we're at the time of the council now. And he says that the basic tenets of existentialism, this new system that they want to bring into the church, is the primacy of the subjectivity and the rejection of systematic, uh, systematic Thomistic philosophy and theology. So everything I've said about existentialism, just remember those two points if you want to keep it in your head. Number one, 
the primacy of the subjectivity. Number two, the rejection of systematic Thomistic philosophy and theology. That's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And Father Lee goes on. He says, from the existentialist viewpoint, the world is in constant flux. And so also the philosophy which studies the changing world. The Catholic, therefore, must baptize whatever is current, such as the World Council of Churches. That's why we have ecumenism. Anyway, has to baptize whatever is current and discard the perennial philosophy as useless for meeting the changing condition. That's what Ratzinger believed. Thomism is useless. Since there is no stable and enduring philosophy, the subjective experience of human life and religious phenomena is the ultimate criteria of truth in any given personal situation or historic circumstance. What is Father Anthony Lee doing in 1963? He's defining Francis's synod, the supremacy of the pastoral needs of the moment over the doctrinal. I'll connect more of these dots in a bit. So, what Father Anthony Lee, of course, is talking about is the new theology, the state of constant flux, some transformation of the dogmatic message over the course of the centuries, and the rejection of Thomism, rejection of Thomistic philosophy, and the acceptance of the modern subject, uh, subjectivist existential philosophy. Okay, now Pope John Paul II basically acted according to these norms. Pope Benedict II basically acted according to these norms. What's different is Francis says it. He doesn't say it in this terminology, but he says it openly. Again, Pius XII, there is a good, that, that if we were to accept such an opinion, the truth is in a constant flux, what would become of the unchangeable dogmas of the Catholic faith, and what would become of the unity and stability of that faith, again, predicted by David Greenstock in this magnificent essay, Thomism in the New Theology. What will happen, he says, any aberration will be possible. Any aberration will be possible, okay? It opens the door for anything. Now, he gives this example within the context of ascetical and mystical theology. He points out that ascetical and mystical theology must be firmly grounded in doctrine. I am not a priest. I am not a, conf a confessor. But I do know that if, a pre if you would go to confession with a priest and said the Blessed Mother appeared to me, and told me that there are four persons in the Trinity and I have to believe it because the, the, the vision said it, the priest would say, you have to know your doctrine first. And anything that contradicts doctrine, you push aside. Okay, that's the criteria, the doctrine, not the experience. But Greenstock points out that the problem with mysticism is the mystic has these experiences and therefore will elevate them above doctrine. This has been a constant problem in the church what happens then when we have a new system where we don't have that solid doctrine to fall back on, that everything's not based on an unchangeable truth? And he says, once spirituality is effect, I'm quoting him now, again, a true prophet, once spirituality is effectively separated from dog dogma, then any aberration is possible, as we know only too well from bitter experience. Okay? So I will take Father Greenstock's words and apply them to what's going on with the council and the synod with the elevation of pastoral. And instead of mysticism, I'm going to say pastoral. Once pastoral practice is effectively separated from dogma, then any aberration is not only possible, any aberration is likely. It's bound to happen, as we know from the bitter experience of the past 50 years. Now, I want to get directly now, more into the present, direct applications to Vatican II and two of the leading luminaries of Vatican II, Father Eve Congar and Father Bernard Herring, both disciples of the New Theology. Congar, elevation, Congar elevates the person over objective truth, and Bernard Herring elevates the person over objective morals. And this is where we get the man-centeredness of Vatican II. Now, Yves Hungar, we've got this terrific quote from Archbishop Lefebvre, where in his, in his book, uh, I Accuse the Council, on page 21, he quotes 
Congar, who admits that Vatican II's document on religious liberty, and thus by extension, it's dealing with, with members of, of Protestant religions, is based on a subjectivist approach and it's moved away from the objective. Here's what Congar says. What is new in this teaching, he's talking about religious liberty, what is new in this teaching in relation to the doctrine of Leo XIII and even of Pius XII is the determination of the basis peculiar to this liberty, which is sought not in objective truth or moral religious good, but in the ontological quality of the human person. Okay, what do we see? Elevation of the person over revealed doctrine. Professor Roberto Di Bate, a speech he gave last year, in fact, I published it in Catholic Fabio News, the, the, the summary of it. He talks about the fact that Father Bernard Herring was the, what he's called the father of the new theology, and that was his modus operandi, to elevate the person over objective moral truth. He says that his point is that the, that the key point was and is the, the substitution of the concept of nature with that of the person. We have a human nature, and, that's, and, and everything is, is based on our nature, especially regarding natural law, but we do away with that, and we just look at the needs of the person. The true ethic founded on the absoluteness of the natural law is placed, replaced with an evolutionary ethic founded on the person. Thus was born moral personalism, influenced by existentialism, but also by the evolutionist theories of Teilhard de Chardin. And of course, Father Bernard Herring was the main drafter of the council document Gaudium et Spes, which introduced the idea of turning uh, of the primary and secondary purposes of marriage, procreation being the primary, and mutual love and assistance being secondary, and evening them out, evening them out and, 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 and destroying that hierarchy. So what do we have then to sum up the section before we move to Papa Bergoglio? Vatican II ended up to be the modus operandi was the primacy of the pastoral, so-called, over the doctrinal, the absorption of doctrine into pastoral practice, and the transformation of pastoral practice into ideology. So we have the exaltation of the person over doctrine, the exaltation of the subjective over the objective, the exaltation of the so-called pastoral, the exaltation of the pastoral over doctrinal, the exaltation of the needs of the present moment, over objective truth, and all fueled by this false modernist idea that there can be some transformation of the dogmatic message of the church over the course of the centuries. Now, what's also interesting is just the way that we saw the difference between the existentialist philosopher Gabriel Marcel and the existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. Now that the program of Vatican II is based on this new theology and new exist and existentialism, then we're going to see this playing themselves out in the way the popes act, the things they say, and how they govern the church. There's go they're going to be very different now, rather than the popes being pretty much the same because they all believe the same things. Okay, it's going to be, even the, even the, pa the papacy is going to be more personalist in its approach. So, we now have Cardinal George Bergoglio, who was elected March 2013. He is thoroughly a man of Vatican II. Young Bergoglio was formed as a priest during the Second Vatican Council and in the immediate post-conciliar period. I remember when I first read about him, I said, oh, he's, he's, <laughs> he's one of those awful lava lamp priests uh, from the 19, early 1970s. You know, it just, just I mean, the, I feel as if, as if I, when I read him, I feel as if I had him in high school in 1974 the type of things we were getting back then. But anyway, Bergoglio even boasts, he boasts that he is the first pope that had be formed by the Second Vatican Council through Vatican II. And the best biography on Pope Francis is Austin Ivory's, uh, it's called The Great Reformer, Francis and the Making of a Radical Pope. Now, Ivory is completely in league with the new program, and that's kind of what makes this book valuable, because things that we would report about that would horrify us, he's... He's giving a standing ovation as he's, as he's talk, telling us about it. But anyway, he says in praise of Bergoglio, he says Vatican II would be Bergoglio's greatest teacher and the single greatest source later of his pontificate. In the seminary in Argentina, 
He was part of a group of seminarians who read the Buenos Aires Catholic magazine Criterio, Criterio, uh, it was edited by this brilliant young you know, progressivist. And here's what this man did, this, the, the editor. He, I'm quoting now, he channeled through its pages the new streams of thinking from France. And there were other, other luminaries that were writing at the time that actually ended up to be in the uh, South American hierarchy, but we, we don't have to tell you any. But anyway, Vatican II ended 1964, and it was George Bergoglio's constant reference point. And Iver, uh, Ivore writes against those who spread this idea that Bergoglio was some sort of con conservative and the myth that, that when he was um, provincial, he wanted to take the Jesuits back to pre-council. He says, if you read Bergoglio himself, this, you, you will not find this. You, you, you will find a different picture. He believed, Bergoglio believed and believes in a church that is shaped by the periphery. Key point, we're going to get to that. A priest named Father Goma, who was, a, who was with young Bergoglio at the Collegio Maximum, where they, where they studied, he remembers that for many of them, the council was like a personal devotion. He and George Bergoglio followed it closely, very much devoted and enthused about Vatican II. And the two of them, Goma and Bergoglio, they would publicize bits about the council on the bulletin board in the, college, in the Maximo. And everybody was very excited about this to the point where the things that they published, uh, you know, people from different religious houses and parishes and comments, they wanted these things that were being disseminated through Bergoglio and his friend. Now, there's another Jesuit, Montes, who later became uh, the Jesuit provincial in Chile. And he was with Bergoglio during his years of formation. And he says that Bergoglio, quote, is on the side of those who wanted a more open church, not a church of resistance to the world. That's code language for he wanted, a, Bergoglio wants to be, the, the church to be counter syllabus. He doesn't want the syllabus of Pius IX. Now, the key thinker in Bergoglio's ecclesial life, whether it be in his younger days, or even as a bishop, or even as a pope, is the prominent theologian of the new theology, Father Eve Congar. Uh, Ivory writes of Bergoglio, quote, his load stars have been two French theologians, Yves Congar and Henri de Lubac, who taught him how to unite God's people by a radical reform that will lead them to holiness. Okay, that's a promise that doesn't deliver, but that's what he believes. Now, how does this radical reform work? De Lubac gets some mention, even Romano Guardini, who's, I think he's basically an existentialist Catholic, gets some mention, but the main man is Yves Congar. Here's how Bergoglio understands how the church should work, how it should reform itself, and it comes from Kungar's 1950 book, True and False Reform of the Church, and it's said that this book was the book that really framed John XXIII's approach to Vatican II. I've, uh, I've lost something here. Here we are. Also, um, just as, as an aside, back in the early 90s, I remember reading an interview with Cardinal Siri in 30 Days magazine. And, see, and in this interview, um, Siri says that he walked into Pius XII's office, and on his desk was Congar's book, True and False Reform. And Papa Pacelli says to Siri, what do you think? And uh, Siri said in some elevated Italian manner, just, just trash it, throw it away, it's useless. Uh, but this is Bergoglio's lodestar. Now, Congar's idea is about going out to the periphery. Those who read, Francis, you're going to hear this term a lot, the importance of going out to the periphery. But it's much more than going out to the periphery. Those in charge of the church, those in high place, must go out to the periphery, tap into what they're feeling and what they're thinking, and then use that, out, that, use that periphery and bring it in so it forms and reforms the center. Anyone who knows anything about Pashendi knows this is textbook modernism. Textbook modernism. Okay, Pius X talking, condemning the idea that we have to look to the laity as the source of progress in the church. Kangar would refine a little more than that. And he, he, if he's pressed, he would be clever enough to sidestep it. But that's basically what's happening here. And I think Kangar's call to go out to the periphery and not be guided by this centrist center, I think it was rather self-serving. 
Remember, this book was written in 1950. Who was in trouble with the center in 1950? Eve Kangar. Who was in trouble with the center in 1950? De Lubac. Who was in trouble with the center in 1950? Bouillard. All the comrades of the new theology were on the periphery. And this nasty, inflexible as a frozen turkey, centrist Vatican would not bend. They are not letting us inform and reform them. Ultimately, I think it was self-serving. I could be wrong, but anyway, that's how I read it. But how does it work for Bergoglio? I'll quote what Ivory says. True reform comes about through the periphery being allowed to shape the center. And Kungar claims reforms have only succeeded within the church are those that have been made with the concern for, this, for the concrete needs of souls and a pastoral perspective aimed at holiness. Partially true. And this does not mean, he says, abandoning essential Catholic traditions such as Eucharist and prayer. Now, we would read that. Remember, these modernists are very clever. You really can't catch them on heresy. It's a problem with Vatican II, too. Very clear. You can't catch it on heresy a lot of times. You can, but anyway. But it might sound good, but there is a modernist sleight of hand going on. And we can get an idea what Kangar really means by this reform when we take a look at the reform that he favored, the reform that he backed, the reform that he was all in favor of. Okay, the Eucharist, essential Catholic tradition. He doesn't say the Latin Trinity Mass is essential Catholic tradition. The Novus Ordo has the Eucharist, therefore it is part of the essential Catholic tradition. In a, new, in, a, in a new package for the sake of modern man. Uh, Catholic social teaching, essential Catholic tradition. But not the syllabus of errors of Pius IX. That's passe. Pius, Cardinal Ratzinger said that. It's passe. Fulfilled its deeds and it's done. Now we're in the phase of Catholic social teaching being the counter syllabus. Legitimate reform. The papacy is essential Catholic tradition. An essential element of the faith but we will introduce collegiality and synodality so that the power and decision-making of the papacy is not going to be trapped in one man, but going to be spread out a little more democratically through the church. So this is the emphasis on the periphery on which Bergoglio operates. Now, what did he do when he came to be pope? He set up the C8, I think it might be C9 now, of these cardinals who would help him reform the curia. <gasps> Reform is a dangerous word. If Archbishop Lefebvre reformed the Curia, it would be something to celebrate. When this man starts to reform the Curia, watch out. But here's what Ivory says. First of all, the, the C8 cardinals include cardinals from India, Germany, the Congo, the United States, Australia, Honduras, and Italy. And Ivory says, you'll see the connection. Thus, by a stroke counteracting the dangers defined by Congar, when the church personnel are selected from a certain type, usually a safe pair of hands who defend fidelity and tradition but take no risks and cause no surprises, <laughs> the thinking, the institution ends up placing a barrier between the center and the periphery. The C8 cardinals bring the periphery, the continents of the world, into the center, offering perspectives other than those of the Holy See. And that's um, Cardinal uh, Rodriguez of Honduras had said that. Now, of course, uh, the Pope receiving input from the four corners of the world, that's what the College Cardinals is all about. It's to advise the Pope, okay? Uh, but the point is not so much, get, see, the emphasis now is we have to have members of the world inputting. But the problem is these prelates throughout the world, well, they don't necessarily have the Catholic faith. So what's their input going to be? This is the problem. Not so much I'm, taught, I'm having a, a, a group like this internationalized, but the fact that now the theology and the formation is so fragmented, you don't know what's going to come out of these men's mouths. That Cardinal Marx of, of Germany, you probably read about this, uh, a young traditional Catholic came up to him and said, you know, Cardinal Marx, we, we have to, you have to be, we have to be more concerned about the immutability and the purity of doctrine. You know what Cardinal Marx said to him? Young man, you keep talking like that, you're going to end up a terrorist. 
This is the type of man advising Bergoglio. Okay, now, um, so when we have this triumph of the new theology, this fragmentation of the faith, this type of thing is very, is, is beyond dangerous. It will only increase the chaos, the confusion, and the fragmentation. So stepping back a little in time, Bergoglio lived this going out to the, to the periphery his entire ecclesial life. Uh, he was a great proponent of what you would call the slum priest, the priest going out to the poor. And again, nothing wrong with that. Go out to the poor, help these people who are living. I mean, I don't think, I don't know if we in the United States have the, the full, the, 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 understand the full brunt of the devastating poverty, poverty in Mexico, South America, okay? Makes perfect sense to me that priests would dedicate themselves to this, okay? But in helping the poor, and throughout history we've had this. We had Father De Smit, we had Father Nelson Baker, we had St. Vincent, uh, St. Vincent de Paul. You don't corrupt dogma in the process. You don't corrupt morals in the process and say, well, these people have real problems, and divorced and remarried Catholics, that's, that's the small and stupid stuff, so we don't, we, don't, we don't care about that. You don't corrupt morals in the process. You don't corrupt Catholic social teaching in the process. You don't corrupt the Catholic mass in the process. But this, in the guise of helping the poor and being compassionate, go out to, to, to the periphery, this is used as an instrument of revolution and deformation. Now, here's the interesting thing, too, and this is why you have to know what you're dealing with when you're dealing with, here, Father Bergoglio. Father Bergoglio, this going out the periphery, actually had a positive element early in his ecclesial life for which he was hated by his fellow Jesuits. Father Bergoglio was made provincial in 1973. He even says, I was 39. The Jesuits were crazy to put a young man like this here. But they did it. You know, They did it, and, and they had to suffer the consequences. But even back in the 70s, Father Bergoglio saw that, well, let me explain it this way. Father Bergoglio insisted that in the provincial houses of the Jesuits, what did these Jesuits had to do? They had to say the rosary. He wanted novenas. He wanted litanies. He wanted the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. He wanted all this prayer life. Why did he want it? Because when he looked out to the periphery, when he looked out to the poor in the slums, what were they doing? They were kneeling down in front of their Blessed Mother statues. They were praying their rosary. They were making novenas. They were chanting the litanies. They were doing all these things. And he basically said, well, if, if we want to be informed by the periphery, we have to absorb and keep these devotions. Well, the Jesuits were right through the roof. You know, I mean, we have these snooty intellectual Jesuits and all this medieval claptrap. That was, that was put into that magnificent electric trash compactor known as Vatican II, and we don't need this anymore, and we are above this, and we are beyond this, and this Bergoglio creature is making us say the rosary in 1974? So he was hated by the Jesuits for it, and they managed to get rid of him. He was exiled for a while. Too big of a story to go into. He eventually was brought back. But at the same time, when the Jesuits were bunking him out because of these traditional devotions, he was also instrumental in crushing a movement of traditional Jesuits that were forming in Spain. There was a group of Jesuits in Spain. I, I forget their name. Uh, but they were really uh, upset with Father Arupe, who was the who was the um, very liberal superior general. Uh, they were upset with this, this Marxist and preferential option for the poor uh, emphasis on the Jesuits. They were upset with a lot, Vatican II, the whole thing. And they were writing to Paul VI, and what they wanted is they wanted to form a separate province answerable only to the pope, and that would be free from the rest of the Jesuits. Of course, they requested it from Paul VI. No surprise, he, he refused them. But now, General Congregation 32, is that the one, 32? Where am I? I think it's 30. No, General Congregation 32 is come back up to Rome. The Jesuits are going to converge there. And this group of Spanish Jesuits got on the train to go to Rome to make their, and also, they had sympathizers in Rome. There were still enough prelates, conservative prelates, in, in, the, in, the, in the Curia and in the Vatican that they would get a hearing. So Father Arupe dispatched Father Bergoglio and another priest. Now, Father Bergoglio was actually technically the superior of one of the priests involved with this movement. Bergoglio went out to the Termini train station in Rome. I'm sure a number of you have been there. 
met them there and persuaded them to go back home. And Ivory credits Bergoglio with crushing this hopeless restorationist movement in the Jesuits. So, um, he says, Bergoglio, quote, had little patience with restorationists as he did with Marxists, okay? Two extremes, two extremes. Now, as for the periphery, one of the things is because Bergoglio was basing things on just the activities of the poor, then even in insisting on the practicing of these devotions, he was right for the wrong reasons. And because every, so much is based on the periphery, this is also going to send him down the wrong road. Because at the same time in the 70s, he was all for traditional devotions. Well, as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, a number of years later, decades later, he would preside, you can see them on the internet, on YouTube, he would preside over these root and toot and rock and pop uh, uh, youth masses with the drums and the girls dancing and all this business, because this is what makes the periphery happy. This is what they want. This is what draws them. Therefore, we should do it. And so, and this is why, too. See, this understanding of him going out to the periphery explains so much of his behavior. It's why he leaps over the Pope Mobile and goes running out to the crowd. It's the reason why he stands and takes selfies with the teenagers, okay? This is a means of connecting with the ordinary people without this blasted curia blocking my way. Um, going out to the periphery is also an attempt to shed what he calls this, this distant clericalism of being distant from the people the shepherd must smell of his sheep, he says. He shouldn't be up in some castle looking at the sheep from down there. It's a caricature, of course, but this is how they operate. He should smell of his sheep. It's the reason why he rode the subway when he was, when he was in Buenos Aires. It's also the reason why he talks so freely to journalists. He says, we shouldn't have these barriers. The journalists should just be able to ask me anything, anything they want. Well, you know, if you had a Pius X, maybe I wouldn't mind that. But this man, I mean, Germain Grise, moral theologian, when... Now, I've never heard Germain Grise, very careful, never heard him ever criticize a post-conciliar pope. He basically says that when Bergoglio talks to these journalists, he sounds like a man talking who has just finished a fine meal with lots of wine. That's how Grise sees it. So anyway, going out to the periphery. Now, what else is this periphery? What else do we see with the going out the periphery? It means going out to get the marginalized those who are not accepted by society, and also by extension, those who are not accepted, quote unquote, by the church, such as divorced and remarried people. We need to find a place for them without, ha without them having to change, is really what it is. This is the why he receives the transgender person, a transgender person, whom he embraced and said publicly, you are, the son you are a son of the church. I didn't hear him say, go and sin no more. Okay, you are a son of the church. Okay, and what and, and he is oblivious to the raging, fang dripping homosexual movement who wants who pretty much want us dead. They hate us, and they're gonna use Bergoglio's actions of embracing homosexuals and embrace they're gonna use that against us. He he's he's he seems to be oblivious of all that. So the center being formed by the periphery again is the heart of Francis's idea of collegiality and synodality. We're starting to come to the end here. Now, there is much to focus on in the synod and regarding divorced and remarried people, but too few people are paying attention to what's coming the, down the pike after this. Now, for years, and given these talks, I've been saying that we are only in the early stages of the Vatican II revolution. There is many more changes to come. People think that Vatican II took the pre-Vatican II church, which was a fixed form, and then transferred it to a new, improved, fixed form. No, in evolutionary theology, in evolutionary philosophy, in evolutionary thinking, there is no such thing as a fixed form. For those of you who have a little philosophy, in evolutionary philosophy, there is no such thing as a formal cause, and there is no such thing as a final cause. There is just movement and movement and movement and movement. And so this is what we are facing within the Catholic Church, constant 
movement if this thinking is allowed to continue. Now, what's coming down the pike is a restructure and reformation of the Catholic Church itself. Um, this is based on the modernist thinking of people like Cardinal Martini, Archbishop John Quinn, Cardinal Lehman, and of course, your friend and mine, Walter Cardinal Casper. Have any of you heard of something called the St. Gallen Group? Anybody? Well, I'll, be, I'll be publishing it in Catholic Family News next month, but I'm talking about it here. A number of bishops complained that John Paul II was too conservative. He's running the church like a monarchy. He's interfering with the decisions of the, of, of the conference of bishops of a given country like the United States, or what you would call the supranational conference of bishops like they have in South America. All the South American bishops get together at Araposita, uh, Araposita to, 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 to form these documents and things, okay? And they are, they are, are <laughs> upset that Ratzinger is too conservative because, um, because Ratzinger says that the universal church is of higher good than the local church, okay? Which means that the head of the universal church, the pope, might have to step in and fix something that's in the documents or in the workings of a national church, a national bishops conference. Uh, this, this actually happened in South America, that uh, John Paul II had to step in because they were going too far. So Bergoglio and those like him would say, that we need a further development of the council's teaching on collegiality to give the national bishops' conferences more autonomy from Rome. Again, we're keeping the essentials, as Congar would say, but we're restructuring it for the, for the alleged needs of the time. And we need more collegiality and sonatality to have the world's bishops involved in policy making and decision making for the, for the church we can't have this old-fashioned monarchical top-down, but it has to be more democratic and collegial. Now, Synod, 1999, Cardinal Martini, who I qu quoted earlier, he publicly called for more collegiality and more synodology as an approach to church government. It did not go well down well with John Paul II's Vatican. Even he would not go that far. Uh, but with Bergoglio, what we're going to see is him being admirer of Martini, as we're going to see. Uh, they want to take this new structure to its full romping point. In the interview that Bergoglio, Pop, uh, Papa Bergoglio, Pope Francis, gave with Eugene Scalfari in La Repubblica, October 2013, here's what Francis says. Now listen, based on everything I've said so far, listen to, the, listen, listen to what he says. I am not St. Francis of Assisi, and I do not have his strength and his holiness, but I am the Bishop of Rome and the Pope of the Catholic world. The first thing I decided was to appoint a group of eight cardinals to be my advisors, not courtiers, but wise people who share my own feelings. This is the beginning of a church with an organization that is not just top-down, but also horizontal. When Cardinal Martini talked about focusing on the councils and the synods, he knew how long and difficult it would be to go down that direction gently, firmly, and tenaciously. Okay, he's just told us his program. He just told us his program. Now, the St. Gallen's group was a group of bishops reacting against this Vatican interference in the National Bishops' Conferences. It was organized by Bishop Ivo Führer, F-U-R-E-R, -E from Switzerland, the Diocese of St. Gallen's, group of progressivist prelates who were working again for this more solegial, horizontal, synodal approach to the church. His main members, its main members consisted of, of course, Jesuit Cardinal Martini, whom Bergoglio called a prophetic figure, a father for the whole church. <clears throat> Cardinal Godfrey Daniels of Belgium, another liberal, another modernist. Carl Lehman of Mainz, another modernist. Cardinal Comac Murphy Connor of Westminster, England, and of course, Walter Carter Casper, and also the thoughts and ideas of Archbishop Quinn, who laid a lot of this out in a best selling book of 1999 called The Reform of the Papacy. I'm going to quote Ivoro directly. <clears throat> he says, Martin, could someone get me a little drink of water? Just a little cup, please. Thank you. 
and we are, we, are, we are coming to the end. But Martini and Daniels, he said, often dubbed by journalists as liberals or progressives, were, a, were more accurately described as reformers. Okay, they want to give it a nicer name. Thank you very much. Reformers, reformisti. Reformisti. As opposed to the conservatives, <laughs> who he calls the rigoristi, the rigorist. Okay? Now, there were two different emphasis. Oh, oh, the rigorist, listen to this, who dominated John Paul II's Curia. Okay? You can see how shift, the shift in thinking is astounding. But anyway. There were two different emphases involved, he said, where the rigoristi wished church teaching to be clear and unambiguous. Imagine that. The reformisti wished it to be credible in a pluralistic society. In other words, it wants to allow the sheep to dictate how they're going to be preached to. Or that, that terrific open letter that was just given by um, Bishop Jean Lenga of Kazakhstan. He said, he, he, he complains to the fact that in the new system, I'm quoting him now, the sinners give the church the instruction of how the church is to serve them. <laughs> it's wonderful. But Ivory continues. He says, behind these two tendencies, the rigoristi and the reformisti, lurked two different ecclesiologies. Absolutely right. The rigoristi wanted to tighten Vatican control over questions of doctrine and discipline, where the reformisti, the reformers, wanted greater freedom in acting and applying church norms in local situations. The rigoristi like to close down debate, and the Vatican will do that. We are not talking, this is not a subject open to debate, okay, like women priests, okay? They hate that. They don't think that the Vatican should have the right to do that. The rigoristi like to close down debate, making clear that the norms were clear and unchanging. The reformisti, the reformers, preferred to keep some things open, basically everything open, except their own power, but everything open, uh, some things open, believing that in matters of ecclesiastical discipline, rather than unchanging doctrine of the faith and morals, the local church should be the universal, should, should help the universal church discern the need for the changes in pastoral, pastoral practice, okay? So the periphery church is going to be informing and reforming the center of the church, but again, he makes this distinction we're only talking matters of ecclesial discipline, not doctrine and morals. Again, we are faced with this constant false dichotomy of the alleged pastoral over the doctrinal. And, well, I, I, I kind of want to flatten this falsehood with an example, and I hope none of you are disturbed by the example that I give. But imagine the Father Violet invites me to come here and he says, uh, I want you to come, and I want, to give you, I want you to give a talk on the sacrament of marriage and marital fidelity. So I come, and I sit up here, and I give a picture-perfect talk from the Council of Trent, from the Catechisms, from Costi Canubi, from everything, absolute perfect doctrine on the, the full Catholic teaching on marriage. But the whole time I'm up here, I have sitting on my lap a beautiful, shapely, 24-year-old woman who's not my wife. My wife's home in Buffalo. So I step off stage, and you say to me, I was scandalized by that presentation, and I respond, well, I didn't change doctrine. I kept the doctrine. Why are you upset? I kept the doctrine. This is the type of lunacy we get from the Vatican now. Pope Francis, we're not changing doctrine. Cardinal, well, Cardinal, we're not changing doctrine. We're just changing pastoral practice. The pastoral practice has to support the doctrine. But because the modern new theology is based on modern false philosophies, and these false philosophies are not on speaking terms with the principle of non-contradiction, then anything is possible, and we get this type of lunacy. So anyway, back to collegiality and synodality. They want to give national or local bishops' conference greater autonomy. Many reasons for doing this. One of them is for the sake of ecumenism. Now, John Paul II, in Ut Unum Sin, he did promise a reformation of the papacy along the lines of, of ecumenism, so it can be done, right? They could argue that. 
Also, they argue that we can't really make any ecumenical progress when we still have the pope acting like the centrist monarch. They're not going to take us seriously. So for the sake of ecumenism, they want this, 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 this new, new, uh, new approach to the papacy. And here's Cardinal Ras. Here he is. You know, I like to say that the girl sitting on my lap, okay, you would think, I mean, if I said, no, 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 I'm not changing the doctrine. I'm just proposing a reconciled infidelity, a reconciled diversity. This is how Cardinal Casper talks. When he's talking about giving all these local churches, national churches, greater autonomy, here's what he says. The ultimate aim is not a uniform, an, an, an un, no. The ultimate aim is not a uniformed, united church, but one, but a church of reconciled diversity. Okay, we have a yet another new term, reconciled diversity, which means this this thinking and the principle of non-contradiction are not on speaking terms. Okay, reconciled infidelity, reconciled diversity, and this unfortunately is one of Archbishop Bergoglio's cardinal. I mean, uh, uh, Cardinal Bergoglio's, Pope Francis's favorite terms. In reference to ecumenism, that's how he talks. He tells a group of Pentecostals, Protestant Pentecostals, that he's interested in reconciled diversity, that he is interested in, he says, I am not looking to convert you. I'm looking that we just meet in the middle. Okay? Now, Bergoglio's mind in this way is one with the St. Gallen group and Archbishop Quinn. Now, I have mentioned Bergoglio's unqualified praise of Martini and his support of Martini's program, but also there's Archbishop Quinn. Now, Quinn, in his 1999 book, The Reform of the Papacy, he called for greater collegiality and synodality along the lines of Cardinal Martini. He called for a greater decentralization of the church's governance. He called for a method of choosing bishops that's more like that of the Anglicans and the schismatic Orthodox. He denounced the Curia as a barrier between the pope and the rest of the bishops. Sound familiar? OK. He called for more self-government and regional patriarchs who will appoint their own bishops and also decide liturgical questions. He calls for a more decentralization, more horizontal communications, more internalization, and greater partic participation of laymen, particularly women, in decision-making offices in the curia. OK. That's what he called for. And just before the cardinals went into the 2013 conclave, less than two years ago, that elected Bergoglio as pope, Cardinal Bergoglio happened to bump into Archbishop Quinn outside of a coffee shop in Rome. And Bergoglio said to Quinn, this is a direct quote, I've read your book and I am hoping what it proposes will be implemented. Okay, I'll say it again. Bergoglio said to Quinn, I've read your book, and I'm hoping what, proposes it, what it proposes is implemented. And Quinn himself told the story at a conference in St. Louis in, 20, in June 2014. We are looking at the complete dismantling now, the complete fragmentation of unity. Because in his first apostolic exhortation, whatever it's called, Evangelium Gaudium, um, Francis signaled his intention to give bishops' conferences, listen to this, genuine doctrinal authority. The final word will not be Rome. The final word will be Timothy Dolan in his group, or Cardinal Marx in his group. See. This is the fragmentation of the universal church. Doc, doctrine will be officially different from country to country. It's the way it has to work out. And they will do to doctrine what Vatican II did to the mass. Every, everywhere you go, it's different. This opens the door for national churches that could be cut loose from the faith forever. England has never come back. It is five centuries later. But none of this matters to Casper or to Bergoglio because they're all hepped up on what they see as this new reconciled diversity. So Cardinal Marx, the final thing I'm going to say is we've read about Cardinal Marx, who has said the German church is, governs itself. We're not a subsidiary of Rome. 
He it just he knows Bergoglio's thinking. He knows this is what the structure is going to be, and he's just stepping forward first. Here's what he said just a couple days ago. We are not subsidiaries of Rome. Head of the Bishops' Conference in Germany. We are not subsidiaries of Rome. Each conference of bishops is responsible for the pastoral care in its culture, okay, the periphery defining, and must, as its most proper task, we cannot wait for a synod to tell us how we're going to have to shape pastoral care for marriage and the family. Okay, and this is one of the men on <laughs> Regolio's C Cardinal eight, eight men uh, Cardinal group to reform, I think deform the Curia. So what do we do? Very simple. We don't go, we don't just long for the good old days of Pope Benedict and Sumorum Pontificum. Good grief. I see so many so-called traditionalists just pawing at the door of Benedict saying, please come back, please come back. The thinking and practice of John Paul II gave us this. The thinking and practice of Rassiger Arthur, his entire career as Vatican II being his center, immovable position is what gave us Pope Francis. Francis is just taking it all to the next logical stage in revolution. What will the bishops do? Well, I think we have a key, really, from what we get from Archbishop Lefebvre and Vatican II. I think many of you have probably heard this. Archbishop Lefebvre said at Vatican II, there were pretty much 10% hardcore liberals. On the other side, there were 10% what you would call hardcore conservatives. The remaining 80% would go whichever way the pope went. And that's even with Cardinal Burke standing up. And there are a number of people, Archbishop Saba of Africa, they're, they're standing up now. But the majority, I fear, will go with the pope because I think the, bish the, the bishops, uh, the average diocesan bishops criteria for direction is which way is the wind blowing? What's the periphery telling me? Or what's the pope doing? So in conclusion, very simple, we are bound not to go back just to the good old days of Ratzinger, who even rabbis praised for, for institutionalizing revolution regarding going to the synagogue so often. No, we're bound to the unchanging doctrine of the church, what I quoted earlier, to hold the Catholic truth in the same meaning and in the same explanation of the church always taught, to teach our children well, and to be inflexible rigoristi. Uh, not in a nasty way. We don't have to be nasty in any of this. And teach our children, because now we have traditionalist children who have grown up in tradition. And I think a lot of them really don't understand the full nature of this fight. They don't, in fact, some of them maybe kind of resent, I just want to be like the rest of my friends. What, I got to be going to a special school and wear a uniform? You do get that. Okay, we have to try to instill in our children in a happy manner and a joyful manner the true nature of this fight, give them something to fight for, and I also am a firm believer in going on the offensive. We should be way beyond defending our position. Well, we don't really like the council because of this and, and, and this, and I hope you don't mind, and, uh, and this and this. No, we need to go on the offensive. Again, not in a nasty way, not in an arrogant way, but firmly, calmly, and backed with the facts, go on the offensive and publicly ask these church leaders, why are you not faithful to Catholic doctrine? Why do you love this catastrophe of Vatican II? Why do you love decay? Why do you love gangrene? Why? You are effectively telling us to disobey all the popes of the past, so why should I obey you now? You've undercut your own authority. Why do you do this? Go on the offensive, and even if, oh, they're not going to listen, the Bible, okay, it doesn't matter if they don't listen. You make a noise anyway because other people listen. Well, anything I write in Catholic Family News, I don't have one hope that it's going to change the mind of anybody, any person in that Vatican. I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for the faithful Catholics who are confused. Here's the answer. And we give the answer by going on the offensive and pointing out that they are the ones that need to be in the position of defending themselves because they are clearly out of bounds when it comes to the Catholic faith. Chesterton said, there are a thousand angles by which a man may fall. There is only one angle in which he may stand upright. And that's what we have to teach our children.
tell them about the various angles, but also the way to stand upright. So we have, to wrap up, the triumph of the new theology that says the Catholic truth can change over time, gripping the minds of modern churchmen in the highest places. We have the triumph of the adoption of existentialism via the new theology that places primacy on the person over objective truth, where we end up with this crazy, uh, this, this, this idea that pastoral should be more important than doctrine. But as we know, as Gr Father Greenstock warned in 1950, once pastoral practice is essentially separated from doctrine, then any aberration is possible. And that man's prophecy, prophetic understanding, we're seeing playing itself out right now. So we keep the faith, we st and we also keep to the philosophy and learn the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, which is a detailed exposition of what we all know instinctively. We keep to the message of Fatima, pray a great deal for the Holy Father, and even if it is true that we're living in, 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 in apocalyptic times, we've read the end of the book, and we know who wins at the end. So we remember the words of Scripture in all this, be faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Thank you for your attention.